everyone. Uh, my name is Taylor Colmes, and I'm with um, the Clark County Historical Association. I am the Susan McCowan Education Coordinator here. Uh, today we have a special guest. His name is Frank Shear. He is Dr. Frank Shear. He has been a curator of the Railway Mail Service Library since 1980. <laughs> The Railway Mail Service Library evolved from the AMRPO um, Society Library, which was started in 1952 by Bryant Alden Long, author of Mail by Rail. The collection was transferred to Herschel Rankin, a railway mail clerk on the Memphis and New Orleans RPO, as well as other routes. He renamed the collection RMS Library, and Dr. Shear, acquired the collection and relocated materials to Alexandria, Virginia. <laughs> Other collections have been merged during the past three decades and the RMSL moved to Boyce Depot during 2004. Frank received a BA in economics at the University of Virginia, Charlottesville. His MBA and doctorate, doctorate in business administration are in transportation and logistics. These degrees were confer conferred by the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Continuing his commitment to academic learning, Dr. Shear is an adjunct assistant professor in the Graduate School of Business and Acquisition Management at the University of Maryland Global College, teaching a graduate level course. Oh my gosh. And of course, I'm going to mess up here. <laughs> Strategic purchasing. No, you're doing fine. <laughs> ACMS 629 is an investigation of issues and methodologies related to the procurement of supply chain logistics management functions. So welcome, Dr. Frank Shear, and I am so excited to learn more about the Railway Mail Service. And uh, I'm delighted to be here with you and everybody from the Historical Association. Uh, I'll uh, provide more information about the Railway Mail Service, which is certainly a lifetime for me on another occasion. Today's topic is actually focusing on the station that's in the background, at Geno, which was in 13. So, We'll uh, get into the details of that as we take a look at a big, big depot for a local village. All right. So let me, I have all screens that I'm, are distracting me, so let me move those things out of the way so I can see what it is that I'm presenting. And this is for the historical. So, but since it'll be posted on YouTube, my expectation is that other people who are interested in the history of Clark County as well as Virginia will be able to this and uh, listen to the presentation. So we'll go to the next slide. Uh, there we go. We'll talk about um, six different things. You fall into three groups: the before, during, and after of Boyce. Uh, uh, how it came to be uh, and the railroad that it uh, is adjacent to. Uh, then about the construction of the depot and the people the county who contributed to that uh, improved design and construction. And uh, uh, about the people here for about uh, uh, between 1913 and 1958. And then uh, actual question. Well, what the depot after that? Uh, so we'll take a, a little view of what the developments are from 1959 onward. One thing that about mention that I'll mention is Taylor has available a notes pages view of this entire presentation. So you can contact uh, her at uh, Clark County Historical Association. Uh, um, uh, I guess she'll give you the correct uh, email address later. And she can download. It includes a lot more information than what I'm going to summarize in this presentation. Uh, it also has some and, and all the references uh, as far as uh, where this information came from. Uh, and of course, you can contact me on uh, time 
to receive the notes for you. So we'll go ahead and uh, get into it. We'll talk about the Shenandoah Valley Railroad first, which uh, was between 1889. Uh, and uh, this is a view, it's really an artist view. It's not necessarily a picture from back in eight. But the, uh, this is where, this is what Boise, Virginia basically looked like uh, when the railroad was initially constructed. It, this is when you write out where the Winchester and Berry's Ferry Turnpike is, which is uh, now Route 723 called East Main Boise. It's the old U.S. Highway 50 before U.S. Highway 50 was made a four-lane highway um, about south of Boise. The Shenandoah Valley Railroad was very much anticipated by the Clark County residents. Uh, before that, the Valley Railroad, Virginia, uh, and the Baltimore and Ohio, which controlled it, that uh, operated from Harpers Ferry, Denchester, and then out down through Strasburg and on down the valley. Um, basically, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad had a lock on transportation as well as passenger transportation. And so, as you can imagine, when there's little competition, the freight rates and passenger are pretty high. Uh, the original construction started in the 1870s, or at least it was supposed to. It stalled uh, because of the financial. Uh, and uh, some other issues. So the charter existed, and um, several people in the and uh, got new financing and managed to get the railroad uh, constructed. And that started, people think of this railroad line as coming south out of Hagestown, but originally it started in Charlestown, West Virginia, and built towards from. Uh, and then after that, they started building a connection to the Pennsylvania Railroad and some other railroads at Hagerstown. The uh, cross the Barry's Ferry Turnpike around February of 1880. The, the source of that information is uh, looking at weekly uh, column Clark uh, Courier, which was reporting uh, with great eagerness the uh, construction. Uh, so. Oh, as a previous slide, a picture basically, it was just coming through the woods there and um, uh, went across that road. Uh, the significant is that um, people in Millwood who had previously taken their uh, product, Burwood Memorial, and from another mill in Millwood, uh, those products used to have to be hauled uh, by road over very hilly roads uh, in Chester in freight cars there. Uh, naturally enough, when the railroad construction uh, uh, came through Clark County and reached um, Millwood is only about uh, two miles from, from uh, uh, Boyce, uh, ought to be Boyce. It was a natural thing that there was a siding added and railroad freight cars were loaded. And of course, it had the desired effect so low or the, uh, for the B&O Railroad out of Winchester. Uh, so anyway, a village grew at that uh, road and rail intersect, and, and that little village uh, came to be known as Boyce, Virginia. Um, up in Boyce, and I'm here on this uh, Taylor or about Tulliers, that's how I pronounce it, it may not be correct, but anyway, he lived on the Tulliers, there's this, uh, uh, which was from Landy along U.S. Highway 50. You can still see where uh, Tulliers is. There's a little lane marking for it. And uh, um, Upton Boyce was the vice president of the Shenandoah Valley Railroad. He's credited with arranging the financial support, uh, but then he was also a, he was taking care of the legal matters. Uh, since it was a new village, it didn't exist prior to the Shenandoah Valley Railroad arrival. Locane Boyce. Bill, uh, but the post office that was established in 1880 was named Boyce. So uh, that's one of the things that I'm trying to do research, which is Bill versus Boyce. Um, how long was it actually called Boyceville before it reverted to the uh, post office name? The picture at the bottom is a post 
large, taken around 1890, uh, and that was the, uh, or maybe 1900, but somewhere around in there. It's an undated you know, postmark, and um, it shows the original Boyce Railroad Depot. If you're standing in the middle of the 723 seat right now, uh, facing south, this is the view that you would have seen there, uh, uh, right in the fore, uh, and uh, right now is a uh, metal cabinet that controls the crossing signals. That metal cabinet would be right about was that uh, shown next to the station. So uh, the Norfolk and Western entered the picture and so we'll talk about that period from 1890 to 1913. Uh, the Norfolk and Western hurt the Shenandoah Valley Railroad during 1890, or at least it concluded it. It had a controlling interest prior to that, and the Shenandoah Road well, they went into bankruptcy or into receivership in 1885. Um, those who are familiar with economic history uh, where that periodic uh, financial panics and um, the combination of a financial panic in the mid 1880s I'm with traffic being generated both passenger and freight than was originally expected uh, caused the um, uh, Valley Railroad to uh, its obligations. So once the Shenandoah Valley Railroad renamed the Shenandoah Division was integrated into the railway system, it had a lot greater connections, especially heading south uh, when it got into Roanoke, you uh, had services scheduled <coughs> that uh, connected to all the major points in the south, uh, but, but um, also you know, uh, east and then south towards uh, uh, Winston-Salem, North Carolina. So it really, uh, in, in in the financial uh, stability of this particular line, and primarily because the passengers were a lot better. Back in this period of time, passenger travel uh, was uh, almost entirely by rail prior to World War One, and uh, for that, uh, uh, you know, it was my my saying is that uh, for this particular period of time. Uh, the construct depot is like putting Dallas Airport uh, in the middle of Clark County. Uh, and the same was true for Berryville. Berryville Station saw a tremendous amount of traffic to the county seat. So now we'll talk a little bit about Clark County and Boyce citizens uh, during 1913. Uh, basically are responsible for the station building that are there. And as you, uh, this map is familiar to anybody who's um, Clark County, certainly the people watching this, I'm sure are. Uh, but there were three estates that uh, not many people necessarily know the name. Uh, they're Saratoga and Powhatan, and they're located basically in those uh, real estate areas that are um, appearing in this map. So for the first two decades of the 20th century, that was the railway age. Um, almost uh, um, um, you know, almost everybody traveled by passenger trains. The great majority of all your freight was frail. The hotels and other amenities improved all the way to and a little bit past World War I. So that reason, at the time, Norfolk Southern uh, only saw the past and kept on projecting into the future that there was going to be more traffic. 1920s, 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. It was all going to continue by rail. Uh, 1912, it enhanced to replace the 1880 Shenandoah Valley Railroad Depot. It had gone through a throughout its system and in stations elsewhere. Uh, Boyce just happened to be next in line uh, by 1912. Now, when they did that, uh, for about 300 the usual station building would have been wood, 
uh, it'd have coal stoves, uh, oil lamp, and it'd have outside. Um, so that would have been the usual expectation. Well, um, as everybody so you're in the middle here, uh, these three large estates, as well as other estates uh, around um, Millwood, uh, certainly modern convenient, as modern as you could get in the uh, 1912 era. So um, there were three families, the Golden family, the Mayo, the Page family. They uh, basically collected $17,500 and contributed that to the Norfolk and Western Railway, which had $7,000 to uh, create a much better first class uh, railroad station. Uh, just one point of 17500 $17,500 doesn't seem to go very far today. Um, can't even buy a car for that. But it, men are only earning a dollar a day. And so, you know, the, the financial impact of this, that was actually a fabulous budget. Uh, in, uh, um, if that was inflated to uh, 19 or to 2020 uh, dollars, you'd be talking probably about a two million. Um, let's talk about the three families that contributed money. Um, Hattie Gilp was an philanthropist, uh, and um, she and her husband Henry moved to the Kentmere estate, which is still there in 19 the Gilpin family of Kentmere and scale be until uh, both were sold in the 1980s, I believe. Uh, the land for scale just, and I might add it, the highest price per acre for land in Clark County was paid for that land at scale be constructed between 1911. Uh, you can still see that from the road today. That's one of the, that's the only of the three uh, um, the, the only one you still see today from the road. Uh, the Saratoga house is still there, but of course that's at the end of a lane and that's private land and they want people there. Uh, there are photographs online of, of um, the Saratoga estate. Anyway, all the construction is supported two boys by the Norfolk and Western Railway. The bricks, uh, the wood, everything that you can think of that, that was recording that is traveled by rail. Henry Gilpin owned a Baltimore pharmaceutical company and most of his year was spent in that city. He was not around Clark County most of the year. He basically looks, looked at the estate as a respite from city life. Um, so had he been supervised the Kentmere and Scaleby estates and, uh, you know, as I mentioned a moment ago, she was an established, you know, a Side contributing money uh, for the Boys Depot. She also donated all the funding for the, the rectory for Christ Church and uh, the parish hall that's at the Boys <clears throat> Episcopal um, Chapel that is now closed and it's coming on. Uh, that that included a bowling alley in the bottom and a kitchen and, and um, reception area upstairs, uh, as well as the bell and on. Uh, on top of Apple, were all her, the benefit of her gift, and uh, she also established a children's playground. When she, uh, she was wealthy, and she shared her wealth with the general public in, in several different ways. Uh, he also influenced the building station on. Uh, if you ever go back behind Christ Church and take a look at the rectory, uh, that's a Stucco was very fashionable back around the turn of the century. And uh, there's no other Norfolk Western region that they block with a stucco exterior. Boys Depot is the only one. So that was very unusual, but it was also very sin. My uh, influence that, that aspect of building uh, design uh, with some other changes, uh, how the Interior. Um, the next person is Peter Mayo at the Powhatan estate. I believe most well aware of Powhatan School there. 
uh, the Palatine School, as well as some land that's beyond the school uh, coming back to work, was originally uh, the Mayo Estate. Uh, the reason it was named Palatine is because he was born uh, outside out of Richmond, and uh, it was called Palatine, was the name of the estate that he grew up on. And so, Oh, and he wanted to get a country retreat, he named the land that he had acquired and assembled as an estate as calling it the uh, uh, Mr. Mayo married into the Burwell family. Uh, Burwell family is, is one of the keystones of, of Clark history. Uh, so when he married into that, that established a connection between his life in Richmond and the time that he spent in in the county. Um, Peter Mayo's father was a tobacconist uh, and tobacco manufacturer. Uh, of course, when uh, Richmond was burned uh, and basically destroyed, um, none of that was left. Just after the civil, Peter Mayo's brother reestablished tobacco manufacturing and became some of the wealthy, wealthiest men in Richmond. He later Later sold to Continental Tobacco Company, which later on I think that went to American Tobacco. So if you think about Lucky Strike, uh, uh, you're a thin company that acquired um, uh, Mayo uh, Tobacco Holdings. And so anyway, he lived Franklin Street in Richmond, right? Uh, divided his time and, and also traveled up to the Powhatan Estate. Now, tobacco products for railroads are a commodity made a lot of money hauling tobacco. And so there's a reason for that, since he was a major producer, manufacturer, when he spoke, railroads listened. He wasn't just your average person off the street uh, wanting to uh, talk to some of the within the railway. So he used that influence basically negotiate with the Norfolk and Western for a first class station building with electric central heating and plumbing. And um, he also facilitated the supplemental funding between the Gilpin and Page families and a substantially. My personal thing, though it isn't documented exactly how much of those people, each of those people paid, that um, um, you look at the town council notes, for the formation of and the incorporation of Boyce, Virginia. Uh, the, the, there's a list in there of who donated money towards the legal fees to establish uh, Boyce as a town. Uh, you, you go down the list and some people gave, a lot of people gave a dollar, uh, which as I mentioned was essentially donating almost a, a whole day's wages. Uh, a few, I think um, Patty Gilpin, um, was shown as something like five dollars. I'm doing that memory. Uh, you look at Peter Mayo, he had a hundred dollars. He basically paid all the legal fees for incorporating voice. So, nobody knows who Peter Mayo is. I talked to in Clark County, but he was one of the pivotal fi figures, and uh, certainly when it comes to the Boyce Railroad history, uh, he's a player, if not the quarterback. Uh, we'll talk briefly about Robert Page, uh, who lived on the Saratoga estate. Um, uh, the Page family is one of the oldest families in Clark County, certainly well established. Uh, Saratoga, as well as Page Brook estates that are on the other side of U.S. Highway 40, a little south of Boys, or really bordering. Uh, it uh, seems, and he also, like um, Peter Mayo, married into a descendant of the Burwell family at Porter Hall. So, uh, and like the Mayo and Hilton families, he wasn't a newcomer. The family had been around Clark County uh, long. In fact, I think they were in Clark, Clark County at the time that Clark, Clark County was a separate county from Frederick County. Um, aside from donating towards the building, uh, he... he the area of Boyce, about half of Boyce was originally part of the Saratoga estate. And he also agreed to sell the Norfolk and 
Monroe, about two acres of that uh, Saratoga estate to uh, create the uh, Boys Depot ground. Go from, from East Main Street all the way back to the sanitation, excuse me, building at the uh, far end of the lot. That's where the two acres procured. Um, so anyway, um, the Page family lives on uh, certainly in the Page farm, and um, the the current owners are still there. Uh, so now we'll talk a little bit about the station construction in the nineteen. This illustration is what the bay side window uh, or the track side window, the bay window facing the track. Uh, if you go to the Boys Depot. Uh, the window bars over the agent's office are very plain. Uh, they were recreated when the station was closed, uh, as I'll get into in a little bit. Uh, these ornate bars that you see in the drawing uh, were removed, and it's, it's unfortunate, but that's life in the, in the little city. Uh, so anyway, uh, we'll talk about land acquisition, grading, and construction. The new, new deep on the what had been called at the time the Page Manning lot. It was owned by Robert Powell Page and then another person named Manning. Uh, they basically house next to the railroad station where if you had product shipped in by rail, uh, you could put it into a warehouse. Now, it's not just like you see a lot of one these days. Uh, it was basically a very, very large wooden shed, but nonetheless, uh, it, it handled a, a substantial freight moving in. Of um, the town of Boyce. Uh, so anyway, additional land was purchased from Robert Page to create the two-acre state grounds. Track, in that uh, earlier view of the station, there was a track right up against the building, and then the next track over was the main line. Uh, that house track, uh, the house track on the railroad industry, is because it's next to the freight house, which is the large end of the station that has up doors. Um, and so uh, the track was next to the station. Uh, when they built the um, railroad station, uh, they replaced that with a 300 foot long concrete platform with a canopy. Um, about half of the, still there, a portion of it that came a little bit closer to East Main Street, uh, it was removed. Uh, and three pounds long, Long, the railroad passenger cars were about 30 feet, uh, about 60 feet long. So basically, uh, most of the cars that went up and down the alley were six cars long. So you could all six cars at the canopy uh, for passengers to get on and off. It was raining without, and uh, the engine and tender uh, was just beyond that between um, the end. Uh, and the where East Main Street is now. So the leveling of the lot and the railroad construction was done by Eddie John of Lynch. Uh, this company uh, was well known for the Norfolk and Western Railway depots and many other places. It built the station at Charlestown, West Virginia, a year later. Um, and also built uh, uh, roundhouses, their facilities, Western Railway. So the uh, acquisition of the lot occurred towards the end of 1912 because it was originally a hilly there. Uh, a lot of that fill of that uh, ground had to be um, removed and perhaps had to be blasted with rock outcroppings. Uh, that occurred basically from January and February of 1913 until about October seems to be the last time an invoice is presented for um, doing uh, the leveling of the law and, and uh, other incidental modifications of the station. So my expectation is that early November of uh, 19, we're moving things out of the old station to the new station, uh, adding uh, such things as the, the station bench between the wall wiring occasions in the station and and so on like that. So uh, by Thanksgiving anyway, I mean, 
the state. Um, in 1913, those 350 presidents had um, all of what you would have seen city as far as the railway depot goes. Many uh, of the residences in Boise did not have electric light or central heating or restrooms. Uh, the electric lighting in Boise was primarily for street lights at that time. Uh, but certainly, the, the, it's for the gentlemen at the Powhatan, Saratoga, CLB, and uh, such as Carter Hall, uh, all of those estates basically audiences. So I'm not going to read the uh, statement by George Harrison in a book in 1914, uh, but it basically is recognizing the opening and talking about the benefits of the community. Uh, I didn't include the uh, what the B and George B. Harris for. Middle name was Burwell. So I think uh, it's pretty clear how he also fit into the picture. He's probably the uh, attorney for these, uh, for anybody who had legal matters to pursue. So uh, we'll talk about the people who are now and the self between 1913 and 1958. Now, this floor plan came from a deed record uh, we post off ending the station building or a portion of the station building. So what it's showing here is actually this is about a number five view. The post office moved into Boyce Depot uh, around 1955 and it occupied the room that's on the right side of this picture. You can see where they put up a, um, a lobby, a partition for the lock boxes. Uh, the new Boys Depot, I mean, the uh, new Boys Post Office was built in uh, 1982 at 112 West Main. Certainly has a much more than that, but um, again, uh, for the 1950s and 60s, that uh, basically satisfied the service. The railroad operate with a ticket office and record room, and it uh, used the other waiting room as the only waiting room for passengers. Uh, two toilets that were inside. Uh, uh, then there was an express room and baggage uh, was accepted there in the room. When they say freight, it's less than carload freight. These days, if you get a shipment by a less than car, uh, less than truckload, such as SD, um, which does business in Winchester, uh, that was the kind of freight that was being moved in. There was uh, shipments over, usually, in crate, sometimes weighing as much as a ton or two. And uh, so the it was unloaded from rail cars on the track side. People would pull up their on the um, the east side of the building to the roll up doors and load the uh, freight that they were receiving in. And of course, they could get out there um, by the same process. Uh, we'll talk about what the rail. Railroad aider is near and dear to my heart uh, because I did that uh, during the summers of 1971 through 1973 for the Chicago Railway. As a result, I have a better insight as far as what went on in railway depots because back in the 1970s, roads were still more were in the 1920s than they are 50 years later uh, today. And uh, it was very easy for to understand processes uh, and, and procedures uh, that the agents uh, and operators uh, uh, utilized. Anyway, so um, these positions were filled from telegraphers. Uh, that's what an operator is. Operator was a person to telegraph. And uh, it was based on uh, seniority. Uh, assuming the person met the location. So, to position as an agent operator of Boys Depot, in my view, based upon my research, required substantial seniority. You really have uh, uh, the test um, in terms of seniority to be able to qualify and hold that position. There were sins for that. Number one, uh, because of the, especially the Kemir and, and Scalby estates, 
uh, both of them were using racehorses and what they call fancy stock on the railroad, basically, uh, to differentiate between livestock, which is, and um, uh, animals, uh, such as sheep or whatever. Uh, fancy stock is um, racehorse. And uh, when a racehorse was being sent to a racetrack back in the 1920s and 1930s, it went by rail, it went by express. They would park a car behind the station and uh, load the uh, horse in there and off it went. Of course, after the race, it, um, it may have gone to another racetrack, but eventually it was returned to the farm coming by voice. So a race for the agent received a mission on that. And in many cases, the shipment of a single horse was what the agent operator was earning for railroad for an entire month. So that was lucrative traffic, big, and uh, every agent operator on the railroad knew um, what stations had more express traffic than others and, and being sizable. Now the other, another benefit of voice was that it had a clerk sign there. So instead of having to do all the work yourself, you had to help you probably took care of most of the freight shipments in and out of the freight house, uh, took care of baggage. Um, the clerk so kept up the tariff books uh, and uh, did all filing and making copies to send to the office. Uh, it was a substantial work, uh, all that. And it allowed the agent operator to basically focus on other matters as well as community relations. So um, having a station was also a major advantage uh, for people wanting to bid in on a position. And then of course, you know, that, that all meant that there was more workload, small community, and this Boys Depot was one of the better stations uh, because of all the features you already mentioned. Uh, so it was a comfortable place to work, both in winter and summer. And as a result, all of those meant that Boys was a very lucrative, desirable, place from, a, from the point of railroad employee. Uh, the first agent at Boyce was Morris Dunlap. He, he was uh, in, in the news between 1913 and 1929, but at the same time, he um, predates the station. He was the agent probably after about 1896. Um, he was the agent at the earlier Shenandoah Valley uh, Station building and was one well uh, in addition to his responsibilities as being an agent operator, uh, he was on the town council uh, for a period of time, quarter, which is basically the secretary of the town council. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, unfortunately, he died in 1929, uh, early part of 1929. He didn't live to see the uh, stock market collapse, and uh, he had a side investment. In in the Boyce, uh, which uh, became insolvent, and anybody who invested in the Bank of Boyce lost basically all, all their money. Uh, but yes, um, he lived at 14 East Main Street. Back in those days, there was no, it wasn't Main Street and there were no uh, but I've determined uh, from property records uh, and deeds that uh, he lived at 14 East Main. So if you're ever in uh, by 14 East Main, and you can see where Morris Dunlap lived, it's also, well, also where he died from a stroke. Thomas, uh, no relation to the Sheets gas station down at Waterloo, um, but uh, maybe if you go back far enough, there's a from a Pennsylvania family. He was the age of 1929 and 1932. He had the shortest tenure of all of the raiders in there. Uh, he was born in Charlestown and uh, he hired on at the Norfolk and Western Railway in 1891. Um, fortunately, uh, also tragically ended his life, um, not because he had uh, the situation was in the agent's office at Boyce Depot and collapsed. 
and somebody discovered him and took him on doctor back hospitals to go to you the doctor saw patients in their house and uh there's a house for sale right next to town hall uh, on the first floor that was the doctor's office uh so they took him to the doctor's office which was a couple blocks from the boys and um he he said he was feeling better but uh then you know he went uh, to his house and uh exactly where he was renting a house and the trouble with rental properties is in the census records you can't tell uh where the property is that's because no deed for it, or they're not showing the uh, landlord's name so that you can link a particular resident with a particular property. But then he went to his house, was on East Main Street, and he died a few hours later. Uh, what the situation was going to is uh, um, his ticket. He had uh, acute indigestion. Uh, I translate into baby. Basically, his stomach, where the stomach acid leaked and uh, into his internal organs, basically just uh, corroded everything. Uh, a sense certainly very painful then for the second agent at Boys, Virginia. Sylvester Lane uh, uh, is that many people uh, of a particular age remember. Um, he was called Mr. Lane. Everybody. Uh, Lottery, and uh, he was the agent between 1932 and um, about 1952. He lived in East Main. He lived directly across the street from where uh, Morris Dunlap's house was. It's a large white house in other Elizabeths, and um, so he. This is the only known interior photograph of Boy Steve in the age. Saw. As you can see, there was a partner's desk where the clerk would have sat in the empty chair there facing Mr. She, uh, Mr. Lane. And, and uh, around, and the telegraph equipment is on the table uh, in the bay window so that uh, he could be sending messages or receipts with a train dispatcher and be looking up and down the track for approaching trains. Uh, some other notable features if you go into the bay, you'll some um, circulating fans, uh, ceiling fans, and lights, and uh, there's electrolytes to plug things into. None of that is original boy steeple. As you see, there's two lights visible. Um, this picture, it's a wall sconce next to the ticket window. Uh, then you've got the uh, lamp hanging over the desk. There was a, actually a on the it's on the uh, operator's bay where, again, it looked like this wall of dusk. It hung down with a green glass shade. Uh, uh, the deep originally wired for 60 amps. So uh, back then, you did not have any electrical appliances or other things to plug in. In 19, uh, it really was basically just for the lights. So um, that's one of the, the notable differences uh, about how boy changed. Over and what you see in the agent's office now isn't quite correct. Uh, one of the projects for the future is to reinstall some hanging lamp. Uh, Lee Murray was the last agent uh, at Boys between 1952 and 58. He retired and took his job with him. Uh, now he lived in White Post on the um, Greenwood Farm. Very very time that uh, basically he married um, into the family that owned Greenwood Farm. And for many years, aging in it, so he had probably a, he could probably walk to work. It was a very, very short commute. So when he bid in on the uh, job uh, for boys, it was probably for all the reasons that I mentioned earlier in terms of the commission that you received, uh, the uh, more comfortable environment. Depot at White Post is still there. It's a small little frame building. It was moved on a, to an adjacent farm. It's looking pretty rough now, now but he, 
between the depot that White Post that uh, Lee Murray was working in in 19, the 1950s versus uh, the work in at Boyce. So anyway, the Boyce has to freight, express, telegram, traffic all declined quickly through the 50s. When the revenue went down, the NW did what most railroads did. They started closing stations because it just, you were spending more money for salary and for the, for the building than uh, you were earning in terms of revenue generated by that station. And so the Virginia State Corporation Commission, the agency, it was uh, scheduled for January 1st, 1959, that the station would be closed. Uh, there was the rare to close things on legal holidays because it's closed anyway and so there's no question is it open that day and closes the day or closed uh, all day uh, by saying it on January 1st 1959 the station was going to be closed anyway and, and uh, the last voice depot was open for operation with an agent operator uh, for the Norfolk and Western Railway it was December 31st 1959 one other person that we'll talk about briefly is Arthur Lowe. Uh, he was a clerk. A clerk is different than an agent operator, basically New York. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned when I was talking about um, Mr. Dunlap, uh, he took care of all the bookkeeping, did stenography, and uh, so he was there uh, certainly from 1913 and into the 90s. An article in W Magazine that shows uh, Arthur Lowe and, and Morris Dunlap uh, standing next to each other uh, outside the station. Uh, um, so, Boyce was very active prior to the rise of inner city trucking and automobile transportation in the 1930s, and in that position, he assisted the agent. Now, he shows up at census records for Boyce uh, during 1930 and 19. It said clerk for the NW Railway, but I don't believe that there was a clerk position at Boyce Depot. I think he kept the residence in Boyce. I was using the route to another location. And in fact, I, I do know that for a period of time he was uh, working at Bassett, Virginia, which is south of Roanoke. So he had quite a long commute. I suspect he basically went down there uh, during the week and then came on weekend frequently. Uh, he died during 1961 at Boyce. Uh, his wife, Alcinda, is an interesting person, too, that we won't talk about today, but um, when there was a telephone exchange uh, in Boyce uh, that was operated by switchboard, the front part of the building had switchboard with, uh, in the later years, three telephone operators. The agent for Chesapeake and Potomac Telephone Company lived upstate park part of the property and uh, my belief um, because it's rented it doesn't show up in property deeds and you can't absolutely Arthur Lowe and Alcinda lived right there uh, but uh, knowing that that was a tough change building and if it's records of houses it's in the right area for the telephone building um, my conclusion is it's like that they did that So now we talk about the depot afterlight. Um, it's like an eight. It needs to live on, even though it has now existed for more years as not being a railroad station than for the year railroad station. A cornerstone of Boyce life uh, for uh, from 1955 to 1983 because it was the town post office. So we'll talk a bit about that. Um, what were some of the other uses between 1959 and 2020? Uh, initially, I was involved, specialized in leasing uh, uh, post office facilities, mm -hmm. and it was also uh, owned for Clark County um, Farm Supply, and uh, that company was doing business for Farm Supply and had a farm implements in the freight room. So it was like a ready-made warehouse for, for that use. After uh, they, the public 
19. Uh, it was purchased by Ian Rodway, who turned it into a restaurant that was very successful for about two or three years. It was condemned, and that forced the, the restaurant to close, and unfortunately, uh, Mr. Rodway went into bankruptcy. So uh, after that, a railroad historical society purchased the building, and uh, their intention was to try to get it and you know, have a model railroad layout, all the things that you would expect a railroad historic, uh, historical society to want to do. But they basically, this was a, a big, big piece of meat to try to chew. And um, the volunteers weren't up to uh, uh, do it. So after uh, almost 10 years, they sold it and it was purchased by a uh, person who was uh, he also made guitars, and his wife um, sold antiques and also did artwork uh, in there. After uh, they decided that they were going to move, uh, the, the station was a little bit too big to try to put on a trailer and, and take the end of the And that's about the time that the Railway Mail Service Library was looking for a larger building, not a looking for a larger building for its collection. Uh, it turned out that Boys Depot was an ideal fit. Uh, the only drawback is Depot of an archival library, there are actually two issues. It's got lots of windows. Ideally, an archival facility, you want to have limited damaged documents. Uh, it's also not climate controlled. It's got high ceilings. It's got natural air conditioning that worked for 1913. Uh, uh, but a night in the 2020 era, uh, a new facility really is needed. So um, I'll get into that next chapter a few down. But anyway, um, the the niche that this filled for the Railway Mail Service Library, is mail transportation by railroads, Boyce was one of the stops for railway post office routes. Mail was put on and taken off. Uh, the, basically came by the railway post office up until the early 1950s when it was switched to a highway post office and that was basically a post office lot and uh, loaded and unloaded mail for the town. Um, it also uh, is the, not only having been a post office for a period of time uh, that um, well it in the station agent during summers, and it's very, very nice environment for me to feel at home and try to recreate uh, what sort of a station looks like. So that's where we are today as of 2020. Uh, where the depot is going, a Boy Depot Foundation, uh, that is the transition plan from private ownership to future public preservation of the depot. Uh, going over uh, and uh, it's time to look at transition plans for what happens to the station because that station was there before time my expectation is that it will be there well after it and um, we're looking for who's going to take care of it and is the struck for its preservation so the foundation and the uses are all consistent with the town of voices history in my view, it certainly can contribute and promote uh, tourism and economic growth opportunities for both the town of Boise and Clark County. The Boise Railway Depot Foundation was incorporated uh, as a nonprofit, just like the Clark County Historical Society. And uh, 2020, the expectation is, uh, after a site plan is approved, that the library collection that's currently in the station out of bow and across towards Main to the rear lot of 127 East Main Street into a new building. We will opt to historical post office vehicles. There's a 1931 Ford mail truck as well as a 1967 highway post and that will be the home for it uh, in an environment where they can be preserved. Um, the 
Boyce found an inch the depot building and uh, with the expectation that uh, some of the rooms can be rented for uh, art shows on at the uh, mill uh, or, you know, for wedding receptions or um, maybe a layout a club. Uh, in, uh, those are all to be decided by the management and, and directors of the Depot. And so Boyce Railway Depot Foundation will be completely responsible for the repairs, maintenance, improvements, and ownership expenses. Uh, continue to be a display of railroad artifacts, at least that's the plan now, that uh, are specifically associated with the Shenandoah Division. Stay in this records room and the small waiting room that uh, were in that uh, diagram which appeared earlier. Uh, they may have displays, as I just mentioned, uh, some of the other uses that could provide income to the Boys Railway Depot Foundation, the uh, expenses for its preservation. Uh, you can guide that future. Uh, this is a pitch uh, on behalf of the Boys and they find people who are individuals or organizations that want to take leadership roles as directors or offices. Uh, so it's also looking for volunteer labor. I was over there yesterday. Uh, we pressure washed a third of the station. We uh, received the National Rays Local Society grant of $500 for replacing the window glass where it was broken or missing. Uh, uh, volunteer today completed uh, uh, several more windows. And uh, there will also be periodic events. So we'll bend a, a Morse uh, day at the last Saturday of April that unfortunately was canceled because of COVID-19. But uh, look at the calendar for 2021. Last Saturday in April, uh, plan to be at boys. Uh, is demonstrated as well as other related uh, events and gatherings about railroad history outside. In case you're joining the Boys Railway Depot Foundation, this uh, application is in the notes page view that you can receive. And, and another thing that's applicable, uh, if you buy things from Amazon, you can uh, participate in the Amazon program. Uh, and uh, this describes how it's done. And again, this is in the notes pages. Uh, uh, but you look up the um, tax ID number for the Clark County Historical Society, you could do the very same thing. You could make purchases on Amazon. It does not add to the price for the things that you purchase on Amazon. And Amazon will do donate funds a half 1% uh, of the proceeds uh, towards the foundation that you have selected. Now, half doesn't sound like very much, but if, if a lot of people are buying things and over a long period of time, it adds up. Uh, um, they say historical society is looking for any funding it can get. And uh, notwithstanding, if you choose the uh, railway depot, they, uh, organization that helps towards utility expenses or other maintenance costs at the depot. Uh, there, there's also a, a current story from Big Station that did. Now, uh, all of us of a certain age, I'm not sure that younger people have uh, read the Lulu or had them, uh, which was, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can, I know I can, I know I can, I know I can. Uh, um, but the big station actually did. The, the engine could, but the station, station has done. Uh, and really as the moral of the story is that all of us go through changes in our lives. We have to adapt and renew as we go what been originally established for. Um, that changes, and we find new purpose and new... Uh, uh, us to strive for. 
And that's basically what has happened to the Boise Depot. It's had several different uses. It's got a very promising future and definitely it did. Now, if you join the BRDF, you receive a copy with your membership. Additional copies are available. Of, of, all the proceeds basically uh, benefit the Boise Depot Foundation uh, towards maintenance and repair expenses. So, uh, shifted to questions. Uh, Taylor, you may have some questions for me, and um, if there are a lot of uh, written in questions, I'd be glad to do, but I'll turn it back over to you, Taylor. Okay, perfect. So um, I do have a couple questions, um, but like Frank said, if there is enough um, response and there is enough questions that come in through our YouTube and Facebook Instagram pages, we will um, do a live um, short 15, 20 minute um, answer questions about um, the railway about system. Um, so if we have enough feedback, we'll be able to do that for you guys, but I do have a couple questions. <laughs> so hopefully maybe this will, um, will help with anybody else's um, concern. So my first one is, what was the initial importance of the depot um, in the 1890s? What was, was it for transportation? Was it for goods? What was the initial importance? What important started it was freight, and freight is the bread and butter of railroads. Passenger services, at best, have always been a breaking uh, but in the era of the 19, 1890s, of the period that you're focusing on prior to World War I, it made in which people moved. And so railroads were cognizant of that. They actually used passenger services as a, almost a public for trying to convey the benefits of their um, freight services. If they ran their passenger services on time, and was, oh, our freight is fast and it's scheduled and it's going to be on time as well. So it was always, the was um, for the Burwell Morgan Mill, the other mill in Millwood, uh, what are you going to do with all that flour? You're going to eat, uh, there's nobody going to cook bread uh, in Boyce uh, or in Millwood enough to use all that. It was being the for consumption and shipment to uh, urban markets. And so the original importance of Boise Depot made the function that it provided, uh, both in terms of saving time and expense to get to instead of getting to Boise, because that was a road of time. If you went all the way to Winchester, you had to pay a toll for that extra distance and, and that's something that people don't realize today, that most of your improved roads in that era were toll roads, they're not free. So, so, uh, and then because of the competition afforded by Shenandoah Valley Railroad and later the Norfolk and Western Railway, uh, the freight rates were more. And so they ended up paying less for freight rates to get their shipments to major markets than they had if they'd taken it and put it on the beam and there was no railroad at Boise. So clearly it's a slim dunk for freight transportation. Perfect. Um, another question I have is, this is more towards the 1920s era. You know, you see a lot of these movies or highlights of trains in that, um, in the 1920s era where it's, kind of catapulted into a more luxury service. Was that more for on-screen um, visuals or did the railway system become a luxury service? Well, the when we're talking about passenger service on the railroads, the luxury was able to sleep in a bed. And so there was sleeping car service that operated at Roanoke. Uh, they, they called it the night trains because they came through Boyce uh, between midnight and three in the morning. And the uh, northbound train place about um, 
midnight to one o'clock in the morning to get on a boy and get into a sleeping car and you could wake up in Penn Station, New York at eight o'clock the following morning. Because it made a connection to Hagerstown, which made another connection to Harrisburg you know, to a mainline Pennsylvania railroad train that went by Philadelphia up to New York City. So um, going down, you had the reverse, that train came through boys between two and three in the morning heading to Roanoke. Now, Roanoke, uh, you had to change, if you were a sleep passenger, you had to change to a sleep bar that could take you all the way down to New Orleans. They could take you to Norfolk. Uh, certainly, the intermediate, such as Knoxville and Chattanooga or Atlanta, uh, you could go by sleeping car to those locations, too. So that was the sense of luxury travel. We realized today that luxury in the 1910s and 1920s was maybe a little more Spartan than what we're used to today. Dish era hadn't existed yet. That didn't come until almost the 1930s. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, the ability and to change trains uh, was in its own way a luxury. I'll mention, uh, I think the, uh, the family had vested interest because uh, you know the the the, the sons uh, of Philpen both went to Princeton University, so you could get on a train, a sleeping car at Boys, and and you could sleep in car at Princeton Junction in New Jersey, and there was a short little commuter kind of train that took you from Princeton Junction to Princeton. So you left straight to college and came back. Uh, so, you know, um, they, people who are sleeping car travel, uh, and that's basically most of your um, uh, gentry population that are states, uh, they were the big users until you started in automobile transportation and uh, other modes of travel. And then, uh, unfortunately, that trend people started leaving the rails it wasn't really until World War II that you had a spike in passenger transportation and it drops as quickly as it did after that so that's that's where luxury was it was in the sleeping car okay awesome and, and get on and get boys. you can get on and off at boys right there in your own backyard hey that works <laughs> it works and and, and if you've never get in a sleeping car, never been in a sleeping car, someday treat yourself, get on an Amtrak train, and try sleeping car track. Uh, more modern, but you sort of get a sense of what it was like to be able to ride the rails and sleep uh, in a reclined position. Interesting. <laughs> I, I have never been no. on a train or a plane. Um, so that it would definitely be a different experience for me. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's a lot better than the uh, railway museums where they have the robbers or the gun, the gun shooting in there, you know, to uh, do the tours. So take take a, a long distance Amtrak train, easy, go to, go to Atlanta, go to Boston, try a sleeping car at least once in your lifetime that's that's on your that's your bucket list now okay i will i will make sure to put that on my bucket list <laughs> <laughs> i do have uh, one question um one more question it's kind of more like on um your opinion um so how do you think that depots have changed significantly throughout the years through the last hundred years um have they changed for the better do you think or do you think they've changed for the worse what is your opinion uh, um there's there's a couple perspectives there uh if you were ever to go to st louis missouri there was a majestic station there margin and when Amtrak took over, that was expensive to operate. So they put what they call an AmShack. And that's what, what Amtrak called it. But basically it was like a little prefab building uh, that really lacked some of the modern conveniences of a restaurant. 
since uh, Union Station had a hotel in it, uh, fine dining, you know, it was a very comfortable place. So for them, some railroad stations now are not as nice as they used to be. They certainly don't have the architectural quality that some of the stations did. And, and um, again, when you were a railroad back in the turn of the century, all you were seeing was your growth. People weren't doing the forecasting of what's going to happen next and suddenly see that passenger growth is going to drop off. These stay built to last a long time and be very, very comfortable. Uh, and Boyce Depot is an excellent of that. Now, if it had been modernized with air conditioning and you know improved lighting and so on, that you see some stations where they had gone modern. Uh, some of that um, from an architectural and interior design standpoint uh, is not necessarily the best. So um, existing stations that were modernized um, sometimes aren't as nice as say the original appearance. Say about oh, when you consider that it's been has been used for other purposes, and that the railroad period of usage the sh of all those uses, other than you know the restaurant lasting two years, but looking at railroad use versus non-railroad use. Um, Depot has not changed much since 1913. Uh, there was only one modification made inside when it was a restaurant where they moved through bathrooms so that you could walk away all the way through the building between the kitchen and the rest of the um, building. Uh, uh, that is easily be stored back to its entirely original appearance. And uh, the walls, the, uh, the lighting changed, obviously. I mean, uh, one of the benefits of the restaurant was that the electrical system was upgraded. Um, you know, it uh, for, for a been used for a long time, it looks almost close to its original appearance. The exterior, because it doesn't have the train canopy, sustained. but quite frankly, without the train canopy there over the platform, you can see the front of the station a lot better. So I, I don't know, you know, it's a difficult situation because um, railroad stations serve a somewhat different purpose now than did back then. Um, it's, uh, I think the older ones are more care nicer and, and this is an excellent example of that. Well, thank so, you, Frank. <laughs> Yeah, well, you're welcome. Uh, so this is me, and in the notes pages, it's got my contact information. Uh, if you ever go by, the telephone you see there is the same one that's on the sign for the Railway Mail Service Library, uh, and uh, you can also, of course, spot mailing it. And uh, this is what um, Taylor had presented a little bit earlier. Basically, these are a little bit of uh, quick background my hair when there's barbershops that are open so that's it and let me, let me over here to where where's where'd the rest of it go now where it go where it go oh you don't have, um i oh zoom must be over here <laughs> it's hiding from you oh now you wanted to do the the uh not not sure or so I'm just doing the video and um i can't see but you should be able to see a nice picture of boys depot behind you. yes yes it is behind thank you. you very much for the invitation <laughs> and uh i'll look forward to hearing any questions that anybody has yeah and perfect thank you again frank for for joining us today really? and really enjoyed learning more about the railway system because i honestly had no idea about anything you talked about which is great because being a historian and educator in clark county it's definitely something i needed to know <laughs> well and it's all good and the nice part about boys depot is when you study the history of boys depot you really 
industry. And, you know, it's um, many things in Clark County focus on the mill or they focus on Berryville. I don't think there's much historical writing about white post and boys. So I think this is also a niche. That there's a lot there in boys to do, and the station is just one part of it. So it, thank you again, really, Kim. Yeah, not a problem. Thank you for um, joining us, and thank you folks for tuning in. And we will answer your que any other questions you have, and I will either pass them along or we'll do a live um, that we will be able to answer your questions then. So thank you, everyone.